Well, hello, everyone. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hairbrained Games, The Week in Games. Let's get right to the news. Okay, with the start of the year comes an exciting time. This is the start of kind of convention season. Now, convention season is roughly from January through December, but there are certain more concentrated, uh, saturated uh, weeks when conventions occur more often than others. Right off the bat this year, we've already had OrcaCon, which is a Pacific Northwest convention that used to take place in Everett, now takes place in Bellevue. For the, month, for the time being. Uh, we're heading into Cascade Con, which is a new uh, conference way up north in Bellingham, next to the Canadian border. And then in a couple weeks, we're going to have Game On Con, which is a wonderful, uh, intimate gathering of, of uh, fantastic, polite, wonderful gamers in, uh, in the Issaquah area. And then after that, it just hurtles on to the next big occasions. Even before all the big ones happen, there's a big explosion, pretty much countrywide, of, of brand new conventions coming out. And these are exciting because a lot of us, especially for those of us who procure a lot of games, it's an opportunity to go and play games more than procure them. And uh, if you pick the right conventions and you, you're going with friends or going with people you know or going there and meeting people you know, uh, I have never yet had a, a sour experience going to a convention. There's always been something available somewhere, somehow, to be able to just enjoy the time with people around. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Cascade Con um, and, uh, and then you know, Dragonflight and... Uh, Gen Con in Indianapolis, huge time, but that one's a little tougher to get into, but it is the, the mega, one of the mega ones. Anyway, and that, in other news, uh, Gloomhaven, my game of the year, and pretty much a ton of other people's game of the year, is now shipping its second printing, and we're seeing a lot of those copies being delivered. Remember, it is a huge box about the size of a suitcase. This is no ordinary game. So, those of you who are interested in that and want to spring some money for it, it is now available online in limited quantities, and you can actually get it now, which after oh, well over a year of, of unavailability. Uh, and then last, in our continuing efforts to, I guess, prove that many dinosaur games abound, last week with the introduction of a game called SOS Dino, which will be coming our way later this year. Uh, apparently we need a real glut of dinosaur games, but this one actually takes a different penchant in that you're uh, cooperatively working to get dinosaurs to higher ground before molten lava consumes them all. I'm not sure I'll bet that kick. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'll actually pick that one up. I may just kind of let that one go SOS away. And with that, let's get to my question of the week. All right, one of the questions I've had is, what is the largest number of gamers or people you have played a single board game with? Uh, which is a good question, because usually you'll know in past that I play a lot of solo games. Uh, I don't have a, a tremendously large friend circle uh, in, that, that also actively and reliably will play games. Um, but I do have some that I have had opportunities in the past to play sort of mega games. They're not my favorite, but everyone gets in a situation where sometimes it's just fun to play a game with a bunch of people. Probably the biggest experience I had was, was Ultimate Werewolf, which is a game for about 10 people. It's kind of a hidden information game. There's not a lot of components to it. It's more, more of a social kind of experiment game where you're, you know, some people are different roles and some people get to open their eyes and figure out who's this role and that role and everyone's trying to like guess who's a werewolf, who's not. That one with 10 is probably the largest one I've played uh, of any appreciable degree. I also, the second up, second up for that would be Captain Sonar, which is a four on four submarine battle simulation. That is hectic as heck. And the first time, game or time or two you play that game, you're spending a whole lot of time just frazzled, just knowing the rules and what to do, etc., etc. Well worth it if you can get teams, though. This is the kind of game where I really wish there were tournaments and that people could group together and, and really play because I think it's got some really solid and interesting 
um, gameplay that you won't find in other places, but admittedly, four on four, it's hard to find seven other people who A, know the game, and B, want to in invest in it to that degree. I still have it, and I'll never get rid of it. I'm still hoping that someday there's an opportunity for it, because it is such a great game uh, to, to play of, you know, when you have a bunch of people going, hey, you want to play it? And after the first or second time, a lot of people kind of groove on it, like, okay, I know this role, that role, it's the role play. Like, you are on a submarine, I'm this role, I'm that role, I'm the, and, you know, and we, we all, and, and that part actually is interesting. And then probably the one I play the most, I mean, absolute most, is Seven Wonders, because that plays up to seven almost as quickly as it plays two or three. And that's really a, a that's a pretty big achievement to be able to do that. And it's so satisfying, and it's about 60 to 90 minutes uh, of, of gameplay. Very fun. Uh, very very good game for a larger group. So that's the answer to the question. What is the largest amount of players you've played a single board game with? And with that, let's get to our three games of the week. It has been an exciting week this week. I've got the one of the favorite in my series. There are a lot of different war games, but one of the ones I like are these solitaire specific games. Now this sucker is packed. These are not inexpensive, but you get your money's worth because you're li living out the adventure of, of a tank, uh, you know, of, of a tank commander or a, someone who is taking a, a uh, some tanks and, into battle against, in this case, the Russians or the Japanese. Sherman Leader is a game similar to others. There's been Apache Strike Leader, there's Phantom Leader, there's Corsair Leader, which is on Kickstarter right now. Sherman Leader goes into the ground warfare, and the whole idea is you, you do a campaign, you figure out what units you're going to take. They have names, they have attributes, uh, that you know, and equipment. And then you go face uh, a series of battles that you kind of pick and choose which ones you're going to take. The idea being that if you take the, the battles that are tougher, you'll get more victory points, etc. At the end of a campaign, which can be you know, weeks of two, you know, eight, ten, ten different battles, uh, you will get rated, and that rating will tell you whether you were a great commander or you stunk. That one is exciting. I've just got that all set up in its components and I'm ready to give it a roll. Exciting times. Next, we have kind of a change, which is Catacombs and Castles. For those of you who play a lot of Flick 'em Up, the dexterity game or such, this is almost, this is more of an adventure story driven, and I, you know I love adventures and stories, kind of idea where you're not just flicking pieces of uh, you're actually, these pieces have attributes. Certain of these pieces have special abilities that you can use that'll give you extra maneuvering or whatever, but it really takes sort of the flicking thing and turns it almost into a role-playing affair. Uh, excited to give that a whirl. And finally, this came out of the blue and surprised me. I love Castles of Burgundy. It's a very... Sorry, it looks a little generic. Uh, when you describe it to people, they're like, meh, okay. Roll some dice, you're in charge of a castle and you're, or you're trying to build up your domain or whatever. And then came the, the card game, which is a smaller version box that actually explodes even bigger than the size of the regular board game. And then we finally have the Castles of Burgundy, the dice game. Now this is a, a, um, one of those ones like Yahtzee where you have paper and you're writing on paper. You're filling out a piece of paper. I generally don't like those. Uh, I have not enjoyed a lot of those in the past. Roll Through the Ages and others were like, they're okay. But it just didn't give me the same kind of feel of like, yeah, I'm really into the game. This one actually breaks the mold in that it does. You're actually ending up kind of having to do a lot of thinking. This is not your role and I, okay, I, I got I got three fives and two sixes so I can fill out the full house section. House section. No, this is one where you're like, okay, how am I going to fill out in my in my domain space, in the area that I'm building on? How am I going to build up this this particular region, and what box do I fill in? And when I complete certain regions, I get bonuses. Those bonuses will translate to being able to do more powerful things later, all within three rounds of time frame and such. And I actually found myself pretty pretty much lost in this in this experience. Uh, real quick to play, uh, really did feel like it translated most of the core fun of Castles of Burgundy. So very big surprise. I actually. Definitely, probably a seven and a half for me. I'm expecting to play this more than I really thought I would uh, for some of these games. It's like ten bucks, so you get a whole bunch of gameplay value. Um, plays kind of solitaire with with multiplayer. There's some, there's not a lot, but but definitely worth giving a shot if you want just kind of an experience. You can you can this is small. You can bring this and play it on a on a tray table. So 
just a thought. And those are the three games of the week. Now let's get to Tim's Tantrum. All right, time for Tim's Tantrum. I'm not generally, this isn't a huge big deal to me, but it is something that has not impressed me over the years. Other people probably don't have as big a peeve of this, but when I have as many games as I do and I set them up as much as I do, one of the things I don't like is if you have a board game that's larger than 8 and a half, 11, and you try and make the manual as big as the box, I understand it makes it thinner if you can fill all the space, but oh my gosh, it is really... T yeah. I like to have my manuals in a form that I can read as if I was reading like a normal human being. In this case, you have lots and lots of data, and this is a great manual. These manuals are great. It's just the physical size. For example, Spirit Island, fantastic game, crazy, looking forward to reviewing that later. This size of this sucker, yeah, there's a lot of detail, and there's a lot of big words, so I don't need my, my bifocal contact lenses, but can you try subtly reading this in a pew? Yeah, no, it's like, hey guys, what's the rule on this? I don't know. Let me cover up my entire life and block out the sun and find out for you. It really doesn't have to be that way, and I hope that doesn't become a trend. Once again, it's not as big of a tantrum as it needs to be. I save the, the heavier tantrums for later. But in this regard, it would be nice not to always feel like compelled to have to make a huge manual thinner just to be able to support that. Not that they're bad manuals, they're not. But man, it would be nice to not have to try and transport this or, or, or wield this huge, like, like, beach blanket of a manual when you're trying to learn a game and such. So, that's my tantrum for the week. And finally, we will go to our pick of the week. If you can guess the game that I'm pointing to from this picture, I will give you major kudos and a big fat smile. Anyway, thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Harebrain Games.